flowers that Richard just showed us totally got me. And um, the question I've got in my mind is, um, so we've seen how the ground changed through the gorilla gardeners, the ground beneath our feet changed. Can that happen? Can that happen? Not just locally, in you and in other. Can that happen globally? Is that a bigger thing? What is the question I'm trying to grapple with here? Have we got the rights to optimism? Can stuff get good for a whole load of people? For a whole load of people, could some of the sort of the whole rhetoric of extinction turn out to be wrong? Could stuff start to get good? And I've been, because I really was depressed about that stuff. I went on a forage. I went on a giant forage for stuff to give me optimism. A two-year forage, writing a book, doing documentaries. The book, unreadable, by the way, called, um, <laughs> it's called The Turnaround Challenge, with the R backwards. As my father said, like in Toys R Us. <laughs> I love my dad. I love my dad. I love my dad. I did this forage and came across this most shocking thing happening, which is I started to feel the waves of optimism slowly lapping my feet and then getting further, then actually carrying me away a bit. I started to think stuff could, could get good, could get good. So what I'd like to do is throw out some scenarios to you. But I want to start with a story. Okay, and it's a bit John and Yoko, this story. So, and a story about a cow, okay? I know you're sitting there thinking, great news. We've been looking forward to a story about a cow. So keep your excitement manageable. Um, a story about a cow and an economist. And the economist is, in fact, a German economist called E.F. Schumacher. Even better, you're thinking, I love stories about cows and economists. Um, so what is the story? It goes back to World War II. And E.F. Schumacher is German. And he's got interned, because he's made the mistake of being in England at the outbreak of World War II. And he's interned on a farm. And there's not much you can do on a farm with an economist. So the farmer got old E.F. Schumacher counting the cows. And every morning, Schumacher would go, and count the cows, and every morning he'd see there were 32. And he'd report back 32. The weeks went by. One morning he goes to the field, and there, leaning against the gate, is an old man. And the old man says to Schumacher, the cows, they're never going to flourish with you counting them like that. And Schumacher looks at him and thinks, what the hell? <laughs> Next week, he goes back, counts them, and sure enough, there are 31. Does a tour of the field. There in the ditch, legs up, lifeless, is cow 32. And Schumacher then had what he describes as the biggest economic and human insight of his life, which was what he was doing was counting the cows. He was not engaging with the cows. He was not feeling the cow's hair. He was not touching the cows. He was not looking in their eyes. He was not checking the fur on their tongues. He was treating them as mass, not individuals. He wasn't understanding what the cows actually needed. What is the point here? All of us in this room, we're all Schumacher's cows. We're all these rational, dependent, deeply dependent beings. We need people to feel our eyes, not treat us as mass, but to understand our needs and respond on them. So if that is the essence of our not just being resilient, but thriving, do we have a hope in hell? of heading in that direction. So I would like to give you on a quick tour. This is sort of an excavation into the future. There's a quote from William Gibson, the sort of self-appointed noir prophet of cyberpunk. And Gibson says, the future is already here. It's just not yet evenly distributed. So I'd like to give you a snapshot of one image taken by uh, Eric Kurzman of Oshahidi, which shows three futures and where they've already arrived at once. What are these three futures? This is just outside Nairobi in Kenya. Future one, or city, if we want to sum it up. Way of life, city on the hill one. Up there on the billboard, Konza Technopolis. Air con, ICT, perfect water, rapid transit, the 15 billion smart city that they're building outside Nairobi. City two, where do you see it? Look at the photograph. Then in your mind's eye, look for the internegative of that photograph. Look for everything that Konza is not, because that is old Nairobi, the city that's getting replaced. 
of toxic fumes, of traffic jams, of the urban belt of Mathari and Kibera slums around it. That's city two, the existing old city of Nairobi. What is city three? The people at the fence. The community actually taken from Nairobi's um, IHUB. Local people who set themselves a task around a development project. And they're there to look at this city, to look at the new Konza and ask themselves, what does this mean? Where's this taking us? What's the shape of the future coming down the tracks? And are we going to flourish? So what I'd like to do is do a quick skim through those cities against the good life. Are they going to work for us? What I'm about to show you is the most boring slide you're ever going to see in your life. Okay? So if you are connected to your neighbor, this is the moment. Let them sleep. Just let them sleep through this slide. Okay, what is the point? The point is, I told you it was boring. I told you. I told you. But it gets more boring. Okay. This is the juice. Okay? Because what is going on here? The economists like Solo, et cetera, tell us that the real thing that creates growth in economy is the big general purpose technology. And we had mass production, which Henry Ford brought in and which kicked ass and which raised welfare, raised people's lives, transformed, transformed the way business was done and the way cities were shaped. Okay? But as that general purpose technology, mass production, fossil fuel driven, gets rolled out, well, guess what? The return that capital gets when it invests into business, the productivity boost, starts gradually as the technology reaches full deployment and everyone's pretty much got it. The extra spurt you get from mechanizing kind of drifts down over time. So you've seen a 75% decline in productivity, down from 6 plus in the 60s to about 1 plus now. Okay, big deal, big deal. And I really appreciate the look of blankness and bewilderment and boredom <laughs> that I'm getting here. What's interesting is the side effects that go along with this, okay? The first, obviously, is carbon. If you were to try to imagine, dream up the most carbon intensive mechanism that you could for doing stuff, it would be fossil fuel driven mass production, transport and consumption. Okay, 400 parts per million, the threshold we've crossed, we've crossed this week in the atmosphere of carbon. The second, obviously, is social. Why? Because what does business do when it's losing productivity, losing profitability? It tries to save money. And where does it save it? With jobs, with wage rates. So we have low paid jobs and we have outsourced jobs. Outsourced to China where it's cheapest and other places. What's the third pathology was what does government do? If you have stagnant, broken communities where people aren't buying, it gets cheap money in and you have credit fueled consumption and you have high levels of household debt, high levels of national debt instability with consumer countries and producer countries, the bond markets, thinking that certain countries don't in fact have assets to back up their debt. And you have the mess that we're in. And capital, of course, looking for any bubble that it can find to bring back profits. The same week, by the way, that Lehman's collapses, Damien Hurst's artwork sells for 200 million at Sotheby's. You have this volatile mess. Okay, I told you it was boring but you have survived the worst. <laughs> Any of you who are still conscious, I salute you. Okay. What does this take us to? This takes us to what you could call Petropolis. This is the decreasingly resilient city of fossil fuel driven mass production and consumption. Cash strapped, unemployed, a consumer city without the money to back it up. Think New Orleans after Katrina, think New York after Sandy. Is this the city where our cow thrives? No. Let's go back here to the second city, the gleaming eco city, the smart city, the top down smart plan, smart uh, plan blueprint city. How does that stack up? Well, let's just look at it again. Is it really eco? Is that smarter? Is that greener than making an old building work? Is it actually not really a resilient city? Is it a city that's as only as good as its software? Is this city going to be there in 50 years' time? Or is this the iPad city that's actually built for obsolescence, that depends on an upgrade? Have we escalated the unit of throwaway, the unit of disposal to the city with this model? Is this the opposite of a green city? Is this a socially inclusive city? 
Or is this a gated city that excludes the poor, doesn't offer them opportunities? Is this an economically productive city where capital's really going into the stuff that improves people's lives? Or is the product of this merger of mass and ICT a series of innovations like the Adidas sneaker with a Twitter feed embedded in the shoe? Like the Popify voice-activated popcorn dispenser where you can lie there, make a noise, and some salted caramelized popcorn will lance itself into your mouth. Is this the future with robots looking after our grannies where we or our cows are going to thrive? Is there anything else? Is that as good as it gets? Or is there something else that could give us optimism? And that's what I'd kind of like to end on. This gives me optimism. Okay, so this is just one of the type of things that that group from the M Hub and the iLab and the other innovation spaces of which there are now 16 in Nairobi alone are getting up to. So what does this do? This takes the solar lamp, the mobile solar lamp, puts a mobile chip in it. What does that mean? This thing that might cost 80 to 200 bucks for a really good one, which is way beyond the reach of the 1.4 billion people without access to power. That means you can turn it on and off remotely which means that you can't really use it unless you're up to date with your payment, which means that the company can dare to give it to you on a pay-by-use model. Because no one's going to run off with it because it's useless, because they'll just turn it off, which means people can lease it for 45 cents a day, which is less than they're, they're spending on kerosene and firewood. When they get that, they can plug in their phones. They've then got a bank account they can put money into to save. With that bank account, they can then do stuff like buy insurance, they can buy weather insurance, they can buy fertilizer for their crops, they can do micro mobile payments for the Kickstart hand pump, which has a tenfold impact on productivity, gets them access to the underground water table that's available to 96% of unirrigated African land. What's the point here? These guys, it's called M Copper, this company, a thousand new customers a day. Just for mobile lights in Kenya alone, one billion dollar business. This is a model of capitalism that's slightly different. It's not about a market that's tiny and super serving it. It's about a market that's huge and delivering stuff that boosts productivity. Income, when you achieve this, goes up. Productivity, when you deliver this, go up. The carbon effects go down. The social benefits go up. The economic effects, you are creating growth. Income from 60, 160 ahead annual per capita average up to 1,600. What is the point here? This is a third city. This is a bottom-up city, not a top-down, smart, blueprinted city. There's a quote from Ben Okri, the poet. The fields are sprouting strange new mushrooms. I love that quote. Why do I think this city will win? Why will these strange new mushrooms get more and bigger? First reason is capitalism's not going to argue with it, because that's where the actual growth is. That's where the needs are. That's where the market is. When you serve it, that market gets bigger, doesn't explode. Second is it gets back to a couple of fundamental things about us as people that we sort of know work. First, like Schumacher's cows, we like to make stuff. We like to produce stuff. We are homo faber. We make stuff. Second is we like to be with each other. We are social animals. We like to be connected. That is what this city offers. Thank you very much indeed.